Okay, hello and welcome to our next webinar, Land and Groundwater Remediation Options and Scoping the Decision Process, which today will be uh, presented by Martin Westwood. So Martin is an environmental scientist at Jacobs and a chartered environmentalist with us at the IES. Today he's going to discuss the CLR11 model procedures for the management of land contamination and the wealth of guidance available on specific remediation techniques. He'll also draw upon some worked examples and, and explore the importance of keeping the remediation process of a project open and transparent, engaging stakeholders throughout. So as always, there will be time for a Q&A session after Martin's presentation, so please do submit your questions in the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, and I'll ask these um, on your behalf at the end of the presentation. So thank you for your attention, and please stand by, because this webinar will be starting shortly. Hi there. Thank, uh, hi, it's Martin Westwood. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on your on your lunch break. Um, there's a, uh, there's been a few issues on the platform, so some of the slides have uh, lost resolution, uh, one or two. But uh, if you bear with me, I'll I'll talk you through them. Um, in recent years, there's been a move away from dig and dump. The last 10, 10 15 years, which which I think is appropriate because it was. Uh, neither sustainable or cost effective and often not warranted in, in, in land reclamation. Uh, fortunately, the industry has become a lot more sophisticated at environmental risk assessments and cost benefit analysis and utilizing more sustainable and bespoke remediation solutions. However, the, uh, this, this process has been uh, become more complicated and often the uh, documented decision processes have started to become a little opaque so this this talk will set out uh, a good practice approach on how to document and assess the remediation solution um, based on model procedures but also uh, um, highlighting where there are emissions in model procedures which can be filled from other documentary sources uh, first of all a quick safety moment because i know a lot of us work in and around construction and uh, uh, safety is paramount and it's, uh, it certainly is the company I work for. Um, I've recently had a mountain bike accident outside of work and I've managed to fracture my collarbone, my cheek and four ribs. Um, fortunately, according to the A&E, um, I was more or less uh, saved from quite serious uh, head injuries by um, wearing a helmet so it seems obvious and I see people all the time without wearing helmets put your helmet on even if you're just doing a local route it's it's uh, it's just not worth it this helmet is a, a helmet I'm thinking about investing in which is an inflatable helmet it's about eight hundred dollars it just sits around your neck and like a, a, a an air cushion will expand upon the impact but uh, I'll have to have a think about that at the moment my cycling days are on pause. Okay, uh, so the contents will be quick run through model procedures, the remediation processes, and uh, 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 options appraisals, pilot trials, remediation strategy development, touching on detailed design, costing, licenses, permits, verification, and, and four case studies. So I'll run through each of these slides briefly. Um, I don't think I'll be get, may, may able to fill the hour today, but since my uh, cheekbone is play, is uh, causing me to be able to speak for about half an hour, so you'll all be pleased to know that it'll be re relatively punchy, but hopefully it'll just give you um, anybody who's interested or wants to be interested a, an outline, understanding of, of land reclamation. Okay, so Model Procedures for Contaminated Land was published uh, uh, some, some years ago. And it broadly defines the requirement for four key stages in remediation options and implementation and verification. Um, e each one of these steps is likely to be associated with a technical submission to, contra uh, to the uh, regulators and the client. But there are numerous other steps that are sort of hidden within here that uh, receive lesser attention. And the practitioner is left to navigate the processes through, through other documents and uh, and guidance so i'd like to share with you today how how i've navigated some of these practices and uh, and, and share with you a number of projects and some worked examples on and some pitfalls on on how uh, the remediation options appraisals should should proceed 
just just a quick outline of uh, the remediation processes um, just just re really basics uh, the three 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 main ways from an academic perspective to reduce or control the unacceptable risks to remove or treat the uh, pollutants modify the pathway or remove or modify the behavior of the receptor processes are not normally done ex situ or, or in situ um, generally speaking, it, it, it's my belief that the in situ processes are, are, are tend to be more sustainable. They can um, be done with a lesser resource and uh, typically keep a site operational. However, they're much harder to verify. Um, but generally speaking, a particular scheme or site will probably require a hybrid or a combined set of options for different phases of uh, contamination or, or different receptors. Uh, so therefore, you will find yourself looking at your conceptual site model and your pollutant linkages and um, optioneering accordingly. The, the basic uh, methods of, uh, of addressing the, the uh, uh, pollutant linkages relate to, um, could be categorized into uh, uh, six areas. Civil engineering methods, which include uh, cover systems and uh, in-crown barriers. Biological, such as um, bioremediation and natural attenuation, which exploit natural processes in the um, subsurface or ex situ through um, adding of additional additives. Uh, chemical methods, which involve um, amending the chemistry often in the subsurface. For example, uh, uh, chemical oxidation or soil, soil flushing. Uh, physical methods, uh, which can involve in situ or ex situ uh, treatments, such as permareactive barriers, or uh, which are in situ barriers in the ground, or um, ex situ processes such as soil washing. Uh, stabilization and solidification, which again can be done in situ or ex situ with, by the use of hydraulic binders. And uh, thermal methods, which will include incineration as a worst case, and uh, thermal desorption, which is um, quite expensive, but uh, I've got some experience of it, and it's and it is very effective. So the the methods are are, are quite there's quite there's an increasing range of methods. Every time you look at guidance or online in in Claire bulletins, there's new techniques being advertised. So it's very much you need to keep a, a track of uh, of movements in 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 the, in the techniques and methodologies that are available. But people like Claire tend to produce an awful lot of bulletins, which are very very useful and keep you up to, up to date. I'm afraid this slide hasn't come out too clearly. We're looking at the remediations options appraisals. The remediations are required um, if the DQRA de demonstrates an unacceptable risk. Um, as outlined before, there's going to be no numerous methods to reduce or manage those risks. And I think it's really a question of being proportional and transparent um, in, in with regard to uh, uh, the options appraisal. It's well as perhaps phase one works on uh, the risk assessment tends to be a sole trader. Once you get to the remediation options appraisals, it's really about uh, a consultation and uh, speaking to the client and other stakeholders in order to identify uh, the best approach that suits all parties. The remediation options appraisal establishes the basic options. So we, you would identify the, uh, a, a list of the options, and you would need to set, 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 set the objectives quite clearly. It's always good to take the objection, uh, object, uh, objectives and the uh, options back to first principles, such as that you are simplifying it back to the academic sort of narrative that I described previously. And then taking it forward into a sort of more complex world of of of, of, of the engineering um, that, that is required. The options appraisal is an area where I think there has been a little bit of weakness in the industry. Quite often, you do see that there is a remediation solution, and it, and it is self-evident. 
if a scheme needs a cover system, there is no point in um, writing chapter and verse about other options that quite literally aren't, aren't viable. However, conversely, I do quite a lot of peer review of options and generally it seems to be that this appraisal process, this options appraisal process, quite simply doesn't, doesn't get documented and is just the outcomes uh, get provided in a report. CLR 11 offers um, a, a risk for a framework for uh, uh, assessing the uh, options effective, uh, based on effectiveness, practicality, cost, sustainability, and duration, and 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 that's that's a pretty good pretty good um, a pretty good technique in in in, in a sort of a medium sized project. A simple project, it, it's normally quite evident what what's required, but certainly to highlight that that is the case and, and, and perhaps this scoring system's been um, circumnavigated. Probably the best framework um, is the SURF framework, uh, which draws on existing methods with the aim to develop a, a framework that assesses the s sustainability of, of the remediation. And it will look at cost effectiveness, eco-efficiency, ecological footprints, and carbon footprints and uh, and such like financial risk it's it's a good system um, but it really is for medium to com complex projects um, the process can be merged into one uh, you've got three th effectively three steps the options evaluation the options and identify the remediation strategy but it is an iterative process and and you'll probably find yourself going backwards and forwards uh, with, with, with within this now, and I would always advise that now is a good time to uh, speak to clients, contractors, and regulators to get their opinion. There's virtually no point in in getting to the end of this process, identifying a remediation strategy, and then finding that the client isn't happy with it, or a contractor says it can't be built, or a regulator suggesting that that is not appropriate to their aspirations. Okay, apologies again, this, this slide's not, not come out overly overly clear. Um, the best, the, once all the options are on the table, it is um, desirable to go through in a, in a simplistic way in order to facilitate the option scoring and assessment of the advantages and disadvantages and the um, pros and cons and other technical issues associated with each of the methodologies. The, the, the optioneering aspect does need to be holistic. You really do need to consider sort of a cradle to grave approach. You need to think about uh, whether there's a requirement for remedial targets, whether or not uh, there is the uh, requirement for excessive earthworks, whether or not there is um, the requirement to uh, liaise with uh, other consultees and landowners ad uh, adjacent um, sites. So e even at this early stage, in spite of the fact it's an options appraisal, you do really need to be forecasting towards the end of the project and looking back at the conceptual site model. But if you take it in bite-sized steps but along these, uh, along the prescribed steps, but always be casting forward, um, that's probably quite prudent. Okay. Um, pilot trials. Um, I've been involved in virtually every project I've ever done has had a pilot trial. They're absolutely essential for almost all remediation processes, uh, with the exception of civil engineering based processes. The amount of factors that need to be taken into account with regard to sort of chemical fate and transport in the subsurface are quite uh, complex, and it's always better to uh, measure the, the model. So, for example, uh, I've been involved in a reed bed scheme where we collected the impacted water and uh, took a few IBCs of it away to uh, a nursery for in uh, a reed bed off-site. 
um, installation of a permareactive barrier where a small scale injection was, was introduced to the scheme. Uh, a thermal process where material was sent um, overseas to a fixed plant to see if, uh, if it would be operational. Uh, material recovery where we mobilized uh, um, um, a soil washing plant um, to site to do a test run. Solidification uh, where we've um, taken a sample of the material and um, uh, tested it at a, a, a bench, bench level and, uh, and tank tested it. Uh, bioremediation where we've done an on-site trial on material. Uh, free phase product recovery again with on-site test boreholes. And, and groundwater pump and treat where we've collected water and we, we've tested it in a lab trial. There's actually remarkably little guidance on, uh, on, the, on, on the sort of uh, UK guidance on, um, on, on pilot trials. Um, so probably the best thing to do, and they are all very bespoke, is that once you've identified your solution that you think is the most viable is to speak to a contractor. This is what I've always done on every occasion. And they'll normally have a, um, a pilot trial methodology which they uh, use to satisfy themselves that the method can be achieved, which, 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 which they will lend you and implement. There is always a cost to these things, and I know the clients are quite often un unhappy with, it, with, with, with those costs. Um, I think the most expensive one I've ever spent, we've done is about 100,000 quid, which is quite a lot of money in order to find out if something may or may not work. So it, it's, it's always going to be a bugbear. There's, there's no way around it. Um, but certainly to commit to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of remediation without a pilot trial on um, any in situ or ex situ uh, treatments, I, I would advise is, is foolhardy. Okay, again, this slide's not come out overly, overly clear. Um, excuse me a second, I'm just moving my, I've got one arm at the moment as well, which is making life a little bit uh, a nuisance. Okay, so once the remediation options um, scoring has, has come out and you think you've got your preferred remediation option on the table, uh, there's, that, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I've come across schemes that have launched pretty much from um, a remediation options to uh, uh, effectively uh, uh, attempting to turn that into a implementation without really developing the strategy. Uh, the options is really uh, an academic exercise whereby it's a process of selection and should be associated with consultation and should be associated with a documentary sub submission. What, what, what is then required is, is almost to break that, break that, um, uh, desire, that, that preferred remediation option down into a bill of quantities. Rather like you may do with the site investigation, once the design is constructed, you break it down to a bill of quantities and itemize it, itemize all of the work packages that need to be undertaken and allocate a resource or an organization uh, that needs to manage or design that particular item. Um, this is almost certainly going to require an awful lot of uh, other disciplines other than just the lead discipline, economists and uh, cost managers and civil engineers and ecologists and such like. So again, this is also a good point if you've got financial uh, constraints in, uh, to, uh, as, as, a, as a pause point in the project in order for you to design uh, and cost for your client uh, what, what works are going to be required. It's, it's important to make sure that all the design issues um, are undertaken such that uh, there's nothing missed because once the thing is going in, implemented into contract, anything that's missed, I'm afraid, um, will not uh, the contractor, the appointed contractor, will um, be able to utilize that um, 
in a manner which will not be beneficial to your uh, that the value of the remediation. An outline of the the detailed design and costing is is summarised in uh, model procedures. Um, I think if you, I'll give you a reference at the end to the NHBC, which also produces a similar sister document to the CLR document, which actually I, I find a lot clearer and is a little bit more contract savvy and a little bit more outward looking, where CLR 11 tends to be rel rel a little bit on the academic side on occasion. Um, it's 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 quite a useful document. But now, now is a good time to um, start thinking about before you now you've got your strategy and you've got all the design elements being implemented to to think about uh, costings rather than just simply waiting for the, all the contractors to come uh, back um, before you whilst the designs are progressing it would be it would be prudent to start forecasting elements that are required in the future. Um, so this would be setting the the remediation um, in, into the wider scheme, including any enabling works and such like, and permitting and the procurement strategy. Uh, again, at the end of the, uh, the slideshow, I'll give you um, some guidance on where you can get some information with regard to. Um, uh, 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 how to get pulled together preliminary costs on on how much the scheme will cost, but you'll never get a true cost until you 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 got it back from 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 a contractor. But a lot of uh, projects I've worked on have have um, ended up some of the costs of the remediation have been prohibitively expensive. And the um, outcome of the the works has been disproportional. Often the environmental assessment and the risk assessment and the CSM are king, but it, and it's obvious that some remediation is required. However, if those costs become prohibitive, several several millions, then um, model procedures and and, and UK guidance um, does allow uh, a cost benefit analysis. Often, for example, deep groundwater remediation is not feasible, or the activities will have to continue indefinitely. Uh, th this will have a high capital and operational costs expedited over time for the duration and longevity of the project, perhaps, perhaps decades. Um, so, so sustainable remediation and cost, and cost benefit analysis are linked as the costs and the benefits can be converted into monetary value for, for comparison. Uh, th this process isn't simply a question of, of co cost cutting or simply a process of um, just saying the word cost benefits. It is a, a numerical process undertaken in accordance with uh, various uh, government and UK guidance. And I would advise if you do find yourself in this position, probably to get on board a, a cost manager and an economist because it does get uh, uh, fairly complicated. Certainly, it's it's worth worthy of looking at if you do find that the costs are and the technical viability are prohibitive. Quick, 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 uh, quick like a uh, quick note on um, licenses and permits. Uh, make sure early on in the auctioneering that you start to think about what permits uh, and what wastes and what waste management licensing are going to be required and uh, contractor accreditation. The, um, the, there can be significant delays in a project if, if these aren't addressed. And uh, my experience um, is very much is that you're in a queue and uh, a resubmission for a, a rejected uh, license or permit uh, won't get you to the front of the queue and quite often I've seen a number of projects delayed because of inappropriate um, licenses and permits or incomplete material management plans associated with earthworks. 
the permits can take between four weeks and four months and um, depending on what it is you're you're after but so make sure that you you're on top of these have an early word with the with the permit provider and ensure that um, that permit is is theoretically viable I've had a number of projects where we've made assumptions about for example a permit to uh, discharge to a foul sewer only to find out that we can't discharge that foul sewer for our effluent because the downstream wastewater we work, treatment works cannot uh, accept those uh, accept those materials it's also uh, prudent to make sure that your contract has uh, the mobile treatment license as, as part of your contractual compliance with uh, a, a, as part of your remediation strategy okay I still uh, so verification um, I still see a lot of sites in uh, quite a lot of land transfers due diligence that have apparently been remediated uh, but there's absolutely no record of that remediation it can either be located or um, it's unclear if it ever exists um, two, two, two schemes now I've uh, been involved in quite significant remediation that had previously been remediated and much to the landowners dismay um, the requirement for this for the verification does tie in with uh, model procedures and it also ties in with uh, CDM regulations and, and a requirement for a, a scheme to have a health and safety file um, so this this the, the existence of this information may also be required to uh, discharge your planning conditions I'm pretty sure that most schemes now have a, uh, a verification record uh, but, um, as opposed to ones maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago where the schemes I've re-remediated didn't. Um, however, the issues that I quite often see is that that verification record is quite poor and has been left to the contractor and there's, there's been very little control over it. Um, of how it how that's documented um, so I, I would suggest that the verification plan is built into the contract and to liaise with the CDM coordinator and the stakeholder and any other stakeholders to assure that all that information is captured um, try and keep it simple if you're going to put it into contract the actual verification itself it's it's what, what you need to record is normally very very simple but there's 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 not a great deal of uh, guidance on it but a, a lot of it is is fairly simple common sense contaminant concentrations material placements uh, and and such like it it certainly isn't isn't an overly complicated area but it's a, it's an area where i see um an an absence of uh, a, a robust um documentation um basically if it's not written down you can't actually prove that it happened and another thing to know is I think a lot of regulators and planning local authorities recognize that there's a shortage or a relative absence of them so speak to your local planning authority because quite often as illustrated in the bottom right hand corner there are they do have their own little documents that, that they require associated with um, verification of schemes so well, they're attempting to plug the gap themselves and, and most of them are very very good so I'll just move on uh, so I'll give you a f I'll give you a few case studies that I've worked on in the last five years uh, where we've where we've attempted to uh, always comply with model procedures Okay, this was a uh, in situ vacuum enhanced free product recovery of gas oil. It was an elongated plume of um, elm apple in a narrow corridor at three meters below ground level. Um, in, in principle, open trench skimming was the preferred option for maximum contaminant removal, but it pretty much wasn't practical given the, the, the given the land take for the spoil and the engineering considerations and the creeping development proposals as a road scheme going through here that's essential to open 
we 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 discounted other options such as a uh, 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 containment because it was impractical due to services and chemical flushing was deemed un undesirable to, due to the proximity of other infrastructure. So we decided that in situ vacuum enhanced free product was 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 the preferred approach. So we did a pilot trial, and that pilot trial was successful. Um, what we did during the scheme is this: the on the on the screen is that's the final extent of the plume. We actually, when we went into the project, we just thought the plume was this what's described as the eastern plume, and the additional delineation was bundled up within the remediation package. In retrospect, it was the best thing that we ever did doing it in situ because if we had gone for the ex situ method, that excavation would have been. Um, absolutely uh, enormous and then abutting um, the adjacent sites which would have required temporary works and and such like in order to support the sidewall excavations so I think it's just quite a happy coincidence really so we calculated that there's 24 cubic meters of free product in the ground to, rem to be removed and in the end, we installed 200 extraction wells over 3,000 square meters, which I think illustrates that it would have been a rather large excavation. Um, however, the geology, because we, the preferred option was really to open cast it and, and, and skim off the product, the geology wasn't particularly amenable to recharge. It was a fairly, fairly silty, a fairly sandy silt, but it, so our recharge was quite slow. The scheme operated for um, uh, 300 days in total, and we were able to achieve um, 18 cubic meters of gas oil recovery. Uh, you can see, uh, um, you can see on, on the side, on the bottom right hand of the screen, there's a, uh, a graph that suggests that we were nearly at asymptotic conditions. That is to say, uh, diminishing re returns um, from each well. We didn't quite achieve it and we were but we were able to have the uh, condition signed off by the local planning authority and um, but all of these this this was documented in the final verification report and the scheme was then subject to a little bit of long-term monitoring to make sure there was no rebound onto the projects onto the site next door and it was found that the the free product was pretty much entrailed in in the, in the subsurface geology was was uh, was was wasn't going to go anywhere. Okay, so the next the next example is uh, a reed bed for relic phrase uh, uh, creosote PAH. Um, all the lighter fractions were washed out years ago, and it, the, the, in principle, the concept that a reed bed could treat this material, it just didn't seem technically feasible at the time. So we went through the options, uh, pump and treat, which was discounted due to cost and, and, and longevity and in situ uh, product extraction, which was discounted due to sort of denapulfate and transport, it just pancakes on the bottom of, a, of an aquitard. Uh, source removal, while we weren't able to ever accurately define the source, uh, containment wasn't, wasn't practical, um, in situ, uh, um, in situ chemical treatments were discounted due to the, to, to the ground conditions and the uh, permareactive barrier um, was discounted due to the fact that the three products uh, the client was keen to pursue a sustainable sustainable maintenance free relatively cost effective solution so we this reed bed and I'm afraid that the drawing on the bottom of the screen hasn't come out so clearly is actually a hybrid system um, the photograph doesn't really show what's going on uh, in in the subsurface we built in a Dean Apple collection system into the leading face of the wall and uh, was able and are able to periodically we think it's to be about once a month collect the Dean Apple because the majority of the light fractions have, have, have discharged already we're predominantly dealing with PAHs, which aren't particularly that particularly soluble, but there is a slight a slight concentration in there. So by separating the free phase um, uh, in, into the napple sump, into the into the leading edge, 
we're able to remove the majority of the contaminant mass. Uh, we've got about 35 cubes a day of water going in into the into the reed bed and unbelievably because of biological processes rather than the actual reed bed the reed beds are just there to facilitate a, a micro population in the soil we're getting 70 percent contaminant contaminant mass removal uh, that that discharge then is piped to a local water course under a surface water discharge consent to to, to make sure that the system was full future proof in case things didn't go wrong, we've got the facility down there to construct further treatment steps. Like predominantly, uh, we've, got, we've got some power down there and a platform to put an activated carbon pod in that can take 35 cubes a day. We're just trialing this now, and at the moment, uh, we're getting about 80% contaminant mass removal. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. This isn't a zero cost option because there's now going to be for the duration of the NAPL discharge, a uh, environmental management system and a maintenance plan in place where the free products are removed and the, uh, uh, the reeds need to be maintained and all the pipe work needs to be maintained. Um, however, the, the, from a cost benefit perspective and sustainability perspective, this was, this was uh, definitely the um, the, the preferred approach, but, uh, but, uh, and it was signed off by the uh, environment agency and um, and uh, the local planning authority. Okay, so uh, per Murat, I have to be a bit, bit cagey on this one because it's a confidential client, and uh, and and the works are ongoing. It's a permareactive barrier with uh, chlorinated solvents. Uh, we looked at source removal, which was impossible. It was dispersed across a very, very large area, so, uh, hundreds and hundreds of meters. Uh, we looked at in-ground barriers, uh, which were impractical due to the multiple sources and certain certain aspects of the nature of the discharge. Uh, monitored natural attenuation was uh, too long, and it was too sensitive a location. And again, we looked at chemical oxidate, uh, chemical processes, but again, it was too sensitive and there was too much concern about byproducts. So we've op opted for a permareactive barrier, um, we've, uh, which is going to be a mixture of um, uh, uh, activated carbon and, uh, uh, and hydrogen release compounds for, to enhance bioremediation. However, a lot of these processes, these barriers only last for a process of uh, about four or five years, and they need to be they need to be uh, replenished, which makes cost uh, the cost of them quite expensive. I'm always a, a big fan of permeative barriers, but when we're dealing with uh, a trace dean apple that's going to have a long duration of in excess of forty odd years, um, it, it, it it's problematic. Uh, certainly in this environment, which I can't really describe because of the confidentiality. Um, so what we are just about to implement a trial, uh, that trial is going to cost £150,000, which I think puts into context what I was saying about uh, the cost of these trials, they're not cheap, but we're, we're, but we're also quite nervous about the hydrological conditions, it's a very, very fast moving uh, shallow water table, and it's pretty likely therefore that we're going to go for an ex situ uh, 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 treatment step at the place where the groundwater is abstracted um, because of the uh, um, uncertainty over the permareactive barriers uh, longevity uh, for the lifespan of, uh, of when this how long this water needs to be extracted for okay so the, the last case example is uh, something I've been touting for quite a few years I was on it for a long time I kept it to one slide. It's the Avenue Coking Works. Um, other options were considered. We spent uh, quite a few uh, months and years looking at source removal to landfill of those ginormous volumes. Uh, we also considered an on site landfill. Uh, regulations kept on changing, so we get the goalposts are moved. And we also looked in, uh, at in ground barriers. Uh, the, vol the volume cited illustrated that the source was well defined but not wholly accurate, but it was apparent that um, any in-situ treatment wouldn't be successful and therefore 
uh, excavation and ex situ treatment was the only viable option. Uh, we did a whole load of uh, trials, uh, which were mainly um, issue, the successful-ish ones were issued on the uh, Clare website and they're still there for thermal, thermal treatment, washing, solidification and bioremediation. And in the end, we chose uh, the, the, the everything apart from solidification. Uh, no, no single de process was deemed to be sustainable or cost effective. Thermal would have destroyed all the contaminants, but um, it was prohibitively expensive. So um, each so different material types were all put into different process train trains and treated differently and separately. Uh, the site ran for 24 hours a day with multiple dig zones and, tr and, uh, uh, and treatments going on. And because of the variable, the variable success um, in contaminant mass removal of each of the processes, we uh, derived distance-related remedial targets um, for, for the uh, contaminants and within the final landform, so where materials could be, could be placed. It was, it was quite a complicated jigsaw, and I was there for seven or eight years on the design and, uh, and build process. But out of a, a cut volume of 2.2 million cubes, only um, some 30, 30 odd thousand cubes were sent off site, which we, we were very pleased about. Um, it, um, each batch of soil was tested in 250 cubes and verified in its location recorded um, uh, in, 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 in a, a CAD system. And the as, as built conditions were then modeled. Um, we ran in CONSIM and the other risk models that used to derive the, the criteria in order to demonstrate compliance. Uh, the scheme has been verified within an inch of its life. In any given square meter, we can tell you precisely what material was there and where it came from and, what, and how it was treated and what the chemical concentration was. Okay, so there's, there's a variety of information sources out there and it, it can get quite confusing. Uh, these, are, these are basically the, the uh, sources that I, I, I stick to and the, the, the biggest source is the little telephone in the top right hand corner. Uh, just phone a contractor that they're always delighted. Once you've got your methodology, just phone a contractor and speak to them. Uh, the Brownfield Brief in uh, uh, publications has a good list of contractors who undertake specific remediation processes. Their manual's online. Uh, the Homes Community Agency document has a good outline of cost estimates for, for remediation costs. Use that quite a lot. The EA has good guidance for groundwater cost benefit. And the NHBC document, although it's for housing, I, I, I generally refer to that far more than uh, model procedures. I think that's clearer and more practical contractual guidance beyond CLR 11. Uh, keep an eye on the Clare wall, the bulletins uh, for remediation, uh, new remediation techniques and trials. I mean, that is absolutely invaluable. Um, pick up the uh, 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 surf guidance for your optioneering. That uh, again, uh, uh, undertake and affiliate to Claire. And then, in addition, from a costing perspective, um, the there's very little guidance out there, um, or very little generic costing. Probably the best document I can recommend is the DEFRA research project, which uh, has generic generic remediation costs, although they're from 2010, so you probably need to add a little bit on flat, uh, for inflation. It'll, it'll get you in the ballpark and, and even at an early step once you, uh, of your optioneerings um, because there's about 40, 40, 30, 40 techniques in there that, are, that have various cost informations. So even at an early stage of your um, optioneering, you, you can get a ballpark, you know, plus or minus a quarter of a million, 100,000 and, uh, and start to understand uh, in your optioneering stage what, what the cost implications of, of, of each of these techniques are. Okay, I'm struggling to speak now, so I'll come to an end. And But my conclusions are, uh, follow the model procedures framework, but don't be afraid to adapt the methodology, but be clear if there's a deviation or amalgamation. Some schemes are, it's fairly evident that you, uh, that what the solution is, 
but make clear that you you if you if if make clear that where you where if if you bypassed any any of the model procedures because you could be open to scrutiny otherwise. Um, each step is iterative, but try and think holistically. Try not to leave everything to the last minute. Try and try and consider early on uh, what all the um, each of the options is actually going to um, is going to entail further down the line. Uh, document, and this is essential, and it's it document everything, all decisions, even if it's in simple tabular format. It doesn't have to be war and peace. Uh, just simple outcomes, who was involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, quite often in, um, in peer review, which you do a reasonable amount of peer review, these processes are, are just opaque and you can never get to the bottom of, of, of why precisely this, this, this solution was, um, was, was chosen. Uh, yeah, consult with your clients, regulators and contractors at all stages. Don't be afraid to phone contractors. Um, don't, don't let them, don't be afraid to give them a call. You know, they're happy to give you a quote and give you, give you advice. Certainly always undertake a remediation pilot trial. And definitely un expect the unexpected because the remediation will always throw up something that you haven't thought of. But if you, but by, by taking your uncertainty analysis from all your previous assessments and getting them into contract, and this is absolutely essential because the contractor will not look at the technical reports, drag all of those uncertainties in, into, the, um, into the contractual documents. It does feel a bit heavy sometimes dragging all of these key points through all of these stages, but I can tell you now, the contractor will not look at your technical reports, and if you've highlighted a risk in there which doesn't get through to contract get the contract stage, you may as well not have bothered. Uh, also, make sure your verification requirements are in contract. Um, again, quite often they're sort of omitted, and um, you'll be in for a nasty compensation event if you suddenly start adding things into contract. And also, at the end of the process. Uh, as part of your verification, there should be a factual verification element. And I do see quite a lot of factual verification reports, which are lovely, but they're not tied back uh, to the original conceptual site model and the risk assessments. So you, ne you need to update your risk assessments and uh, your contaminant changes in your mass hole distribution. And so you need to close out that CSM. The verification, there should be a factual element to it and an interpretive element. And again, it doesn't need to be war and peace. Sometimes it's just pointing out the obvious. But if it's not written down during these peer reviews, which I quite often do, or reviews for the submission for regulators, etc., if it's not obvious, then you're you're going to get you're going to get questioned on it. Okay, right. I'll finish there because I'm starting to struggle. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, if I could see some questions popping up on the chat. But uh, I think um, the IES are going to direct the questions to me. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. That was great. I think you did incredibly well considering your, your injuries. So thank you again for doing that for us. There have been a handful of questions that have come in, but kindled on longer than you planned already. I'm more than happy to organize for you to answer them over email, if you'd rather, or we can do them now. It's completely up to you. No, that, that's okay, but bear in mind I've been off work for four weeks, so if it's a question that was too long ago, I might not be able to remember it, but I'll have a go. Okay, all right, I'll ask you, I'll ask you a couple of them, um, and we'll try and keep it quite concise. So I've got a question from Peter Fleming, and he just asks, mm -hmm. what is your view on the use of RMTs on-site testing to delineate the area that needs to be remediated? I can't, what's the, what's the acronym RMTs? RMTs, yeah, or on-site testing. Oh, on-site testing. Okay, yeah, we, yeah, I mean, I, we, we, I've used, um, we've, we, we, we've used them in the past uh, for, for the, I think it's the XRF, the gun, and an on-site testing for chlorinated solvents. I think they've got a bit more sophisticated than, 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 um, than perhaps in the past when I've used them, but they always need to be backed up, I think, by, by, by accredited lab analysis. But certainly, yeah, they're, um, they're, they're, they're a good ready reckoner tool, but I would, I would always back them up with, um, with, 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 with lab analysis just uh, uh, that, that can follow uh, the on-site evaluation. 
Okay. Okay. So use them in conjunction with each other. Yes. Um, I've got another question from Sarah Greenhoff, and she says, um, just to say thank you for showing your YALPAG guidance as an example of, of your LA work. So I just want to pass that on. Um, and Natasha Cavan has asked, what does your environmental monitoring program incorporate for the reed beds? Um, we are testing the, we, as we've designed the reed bed, we've got uh, um, a number of points where we can access the water. So we've got water quality going into the scheme and then water quality coming out. And the environment agency have been really, really quite, really quite helpful on this project. And so, but, so we're also testing surface water. So it's water in to the system, water out, and uh, uh, water actually in the receiving in the in the receiving water that the discharge consent is uh, applies to. So um, that will be done in accordance with the surface water discharge consent. In fact, the client's elected to do that far more regularly. And then we're going to have a six-month bedding in period where we need to monitor that formally. Uh, in order to produce the verification report. So the, the reed bed will be effectively monitored forever as long as the surface water discharge consents there, but there'll be a minimum six month verifi formal verification period which we'll report on as part of the planning application. Okay, great. And is that a project that should um, they want uh, attendees want to hear a little bit more about? Is that something that you can talk quite openly about if they do get in touch with you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that that's that's. It was only the permeative barrier that's a bit difficult. It it was it was certainly um, it it was certainly uh, the, the 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 concepts and the design of that was quite quite surprised me. It quite surprised me that it would work. And we we dealt we we worked on it with a specialist contractor that already had a a uh, that proven that the 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 the, the, uh, the the system works, and it just seemed. It just seemed unlikely that a reed bed would deal with um, such contaminants, but it, it does indeed by by compacting in that soil uh, to a, 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 to a, a very to cause a very slow flow and uh, uh, introducing a very 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 high specified soil with a high organic content. Uh, we're effectively it's effectively in situ bio biological remediation. With the reeds, then uh, maintaining that population and also helping us out a little bit with the more traditional reed bed um, um, uh, contaminants such as ammonia and metals. So it was quite surprising, quite surprising that it worked. Yeah, it sounds like a really interesting project. Okay, um, um, this is literally your last question, and then and then we'll let you go. But Adam Grant has just said sent one in and said, would you recommend against commenting on banking security prior to verification or validations? Banking security? Well, I'm not quite sure what banking security is. Okay, he hasn't given any more information, so I can't really elaborate either. Um, no. Adam, maybe if, you, if you've got a particular question that you want to ask Martin, get in touch with him via email and you can discuss that in a little bit more detail. Um, but I will, I will leave it there. There's been several thanks coming in um, and well wishes to you. So yeah, I hope you do get better very soon, Martin. And thank you very no, much for doing it despite, despite your injuries. Um, attendees, don't forget to register this as CPD on a CPD tool on our website. If you've got any problems, do contact the project office and we can help you with that. But you just log in through your members area and it will be quite self-explanatory. Our next webinar will be the Martian Terrain, which will be presented by Jacqueline Campbell on the 28th of August. So do sign up for that because I think it's going to be a very interesting topic. Um, thank you all again for listening to this one and thank you again to Martin and get better soon. Okay, then cheers. Thank you.